Beta-glucuronidase. What the hell is that, and what does it have to do with your hormone metabolism? Welcome to part three of this series. In part one, we covered endometriosis. In part two, PCOS. We discussed how both are estrogen-dominant inflammatory conditions. While I always talk about the inflammatory part for all conditions, now let's dive into that estrogen part. If you're new, be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel and also follow me on Instagram and Facebook as The Microbiome Expert. As we all know, the liver plays a huge role in detoxification. One such enzymatic pathway works by linking glucuronic acid, a sugar, to a variety of compounds marked for excretion via the GI tract. This process of inactivating compounds is not limited to estrogen. A wide range of compounds, including other hormones, neurotransmitters, anti-cancer agents, NSAIDs, and environmental carcinogens are processed via glucuronidation. This process is fairly well understood. What is not understood, nor even appreciated, is what happens after these inactivated compounds enter the GI tract for their theoretical elimination. Since our focus here is on estrogen, we'll go with that. But keep in mind, what we're talking about here applies to a wide range of compounds you don't want to reabsorb. Now, estrogen is produced by the ovaries, adrenal glands, and adipose tissue. We're not diving into estrone versus estradiol versus estriol. And when bound to, say, sex hormone binding globulin or glucuronic acid, it's inactive, but when unbound, it will plug into estrogen receptors. So how does the estrogen marked for excretion become unbound and reabsorbed via enterohepatic circulation? As I've said before, the gut microbiome possesses a huge array of enzymatic capability. One such enzyme is called beta-glucuronidase. What it does is allows a given bacterium the ability to cleave the glucuronic acid, which we've established as a sugar, from its bond and use it as a substrate, a source of fuel. After all, if you can outcompete your neighbors fighting for the same piece of real estate, you win, as do your progeny. In this paper, these researchers took a deep dive into this little-known field. Let's walk away with a couple of simple points of note from this rather sophisticated study. One, this beta-glucuronidase enzyme is not the same in all bacteria. In fact, its structure and functionality varies quite a bit. For example, here, you can see that its length varies from species to species. And here, you can see its optimum pH also varies. pH, that very important topic I'm always talking about, which dictates which bacteria, good or bad, are in charge of the microbiome. For much more, see this video. We see the optimal pH for E. coli is at 7.4, well outside the Goldilocks zone, whereas the optimal pH for F. prausitzii, the superhero of the gut, is 6, smack dab in the middle of the Goldilocks zone. Hmm, no shocker here. More consistency in my data. Our second point of note is that many bacteria, about 25% of the microbiota, produce this enzyme to include our opposite poster children for health and disease, F. prausitzii and E. coli. So its presence does not indicate whether a bacterium is good or bad. So our liver is a bit of a fight with the microbiome, one using a sugar to detox, the other stealing it for fuel. Here is estrogen, one of the many compounds inactivated by glucuronidation. And here we have chenodeoxycholate. That's one of our primary bile acids bound to either taurine or glycine, also inactivated here. And not listed is taurocholate, the other primary bile acid and the key player in a C. diff infection. I often mention bile acid dysmetabolism and how it plays a key role in a variety of conditions. To learn more, watch these videos. And here we see Billy Rubin. At times during my consultations, I'm told that, quote, I have high Billy Rubin. 
while it too is processed via glucuronidation. In the GI tract, bilirubin glucuronides are heavily metabolized by the intestinal microbiota into stercobilin, which gives feces its brown color, and urobilin, which is responsible for the yellow color of urine and the yellow complexion of jaundiced subjects. I hope you're enjoying the video so far. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and recommend to friends and family. Also, if you're feeling extra generous, hit the super thanks below. In this study, the researchers tested 22 different substrates, including glucuronides derived from natural products, industrial chemicals, and pharmaceutical drugs, with five different species of bacteria known to possess beta-glucuronidase activity. These bacteria consisted of R. navis, Clostridium perfringens, B. fragilis, E. coli, and Bifidobacterium dentium, some names you may recognize from my videos. You can see from the slide that there were huge differences in activity with E. coli and C. perfringens being the most active. And they quote, our structural and functional studies indicate that beta-glucuronidase enzymes of opportunistic and enteropathogenic bacteria are the major types of enzymes that regenerate toxic xenobiotics in the gut. On the flip side, there can be benefits to glucuronidation, not liberating toxins, but modifying phytochemicals, for example. These contradicting reports concerning the potential positive and negative effects of glucuronidase activities suggests the gut bacteria display a different spectrum of substrate preferences and that there are specific groups of enzymes for desirable and undesirable activities, with each displaying a unique spectrum of substrate preference. As we saw earlier, gut bacterial glucuronidases have diverse structures and catalytic efficiencies. Now, in the lower gut, the distal ileum and colon, E. coli, Klebsiella, and their other nefarious cousins are kept in check under ideal conditions. They are normal inhabitants of the gut microbiome, but when the gut is healthy, the good guys are in charge. However, as in the course of so many of our lives, our microbiome can take a beating which is hard to reverse. A beating from excessive antibiotics, proton pump inhibitors, bad diet, alcoholism, stress, and more. When the bad guys are in charge, they are able to outcompete the good guys for fuel. We touched on this earlier with pH. While the members of Enterobacteriaceae, that family I'm always saying you don't want an abundance of, possess what's called a GUS operon, which is a fancy way of saying that they can, when in the presence of glucuronidated ligands like estrogen, they can upregulate and enjoy the feast. Now, normally, E. coli and its nasty cousins can be a bit more abundant further up the GI tract, where these sensitive health-promoting butyrate producers don't reside, and where there's plenty of bile to sort through for glucuronic acid but as I said, in the lower gut, they are supposed to be kept in control. But in dysbiosis, you've messed up your bile acid balance, your pH, and more. And you now have protein fermentation in the lower gut, feeding an endless cycle of bad guy dominance, who now have free reign over the lower gut to keep liberating those toxins to include estrogen, which, as we established, gets reabsorbed increasing the estrogen pool in your body, contributing to what we established in our previous videos is a estrogen dominant inflammatory condition. And if we zoom out from the intense world of enzyme structure and just look at epidemiological data, we see from this paper that circulating glucuronic acid is a predictor of health span and longevity. The more glucuronic acid in the blood, the worse the outcome. Remember, glucuronic acid is that sugar that inactivates the compounds meant for excretion, which, by the way, is easily absorbed in the gut. So the thinking here is that there is continuous bacterial enzymatic release of this sugar, thereby freeing it up and the toxin that it was bound to for reabsorption. And as you can imagine, reabsorption of toxins, or in our case, estrogen, 
meant for excretion, will only increase their serum levels and thus their impact on our health. Now your first step could be from a dietary perspective. Once again, studies show that red meat consumption alters the gut microbiome in a way which elevates fecal beta-glucuronidase activity, while dietary fiber consumption reduces fecal beta-glucuronidase activity. Again, for like the millionth time, I'm not going to say go vegan, but watch your animal protein consumption, as an overwhelming amount of studies show that protein fermentation in the lower gut feeds the bad guys. And for our purposes here, it's the bad guys who free up the compounds we don't want to reabsorb, like estrogen. For much more on this topic, watch these videos. Beyond diet, I often hear during my consultations that, quote, I eat healthy and I still can't get better. Yes, I know. It's hard to break away from the cycle of dysbiosis, inflammation, bile acid dysmetabolism, hormone dysmetabolism, and immune dysregulation. You need the help of someone who understands all of these facets. Either you can elect for one of my protocols, or you can schedule a personal consultation with me. And to help make your life a little easier, in case you haven't heard, I recently created an account with the distributor Fullscript for U.S. customers only, which allows for easier and less confusing product fulfillment for my protocols, as well as a 10 to 15% savings on the supplements I recommend, as well as any other health products you may use. If you like the video, don't forget to subscribe. Also, somewhere around here, you can go to my website where you can schedule a consultation with me. You can also view the protocols. And here, you can watch the next video.